Can we just thank the school for letting us use the school? Beautiful. Yeah, it's a gift to us, uh, and we feel that God has opened the door, and so we just want to honor the school for allowing us to be back here together. You, my boot's right. We are in Luke. You can open up your Bible to Luke, but I feel like this morning, was that Mark, but you got that microphone there for me. So I saw a mate walk into church this morning, one of the, one of the team, he wasn't supposed to be here, he was supposed to be racing his bicycle, and I saw another mate that was supposed to be somewhere near Pretoria right now, he's also here, and I saw another mate walk here with his popcorn socks, he was also supposed to be riding, he wasn't supposed to be here, but my mate, uh, he walked in here and he's got um, mercurial all over his leg because he crashed, there was a race and he crashed, and it wasn't his fault because he can ride a bike, he's proper, but he, but he, he walked in and I just had a sense, he has a guy, he could have gone home, put his feet up on the ground, on, on the couch, and moped in his wounds, and his woe is me, you know, that type of attitude, but he decided to come to church today, and, and there's outward physical wounds on his body, but maybe you've come to church today, and there's an inward wound on your heart, and you're like, man, I've come, but you know what, I feel so wounded. I'm bleeding on the inside. And so I want my mate to pray today because B-Rad hurt himself on the outside, but I want him to pray that God's powerful word will heal you on the inside today. Amen? Amen. Not me. God's word. Yeah, so God, we we're all sitting here. We don't really know why we're here, but we, we thank you that we can be here. And yeah, there's a few of us sitting here that don't have the, the outward pain, but there's a lot of us sitting here that, that have the inward pain. So Father, we pray that through the Holy Spirit today, you're going to speak to us and you're going to heal our pain. Father, it might not be today, but Father, we pray that you're going to give us the tools to deal with what we need to deal with on the inside. We thank you that Fox is your, your, your word today, Father, and that you, you're going to use him as an instrument in your orchestra. We thank you that we can all be here and have fellowship and we are. We just thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Imagine you, Luke, and you've given your life to Jesus. You've decided on your own accord, I'm going to follow Jesus. You've heard about all the eyewitness accounts. You've gone to the parents of whose little boy was born blind, and, and now their boy can see, and you're like, Flip, I can't believe it. You've gone and interviewed them. You've looked at the doctor's reports, because my goodness, you're a doctor yourself, and you've realized, Flip, it's true. This oak was blind, this little boy. That man, Jesus, he healed him. You've looked into those eyes that were once blind. You've gone and done research. You've gone and got a calculated quality report of everything. You've spent years researching you, you've gone to those who were at the tomb when it was empty, and you're like, really? Tell me about it. You've interviewed those when that, that stone was rolled away. You, you've gone and spoken to them. In fact, you went to the Roman centurions, those soldiers. You went to them who nailed him to the cross and who whipped him, and you've gone to speak to them. And, and you actually went to find that one Roman soldier who took that spear, that sword, and pierced Jesus in his side to make sure he was dead. You want to find out, was Jesus really dead? You spent years as a Dr. Luke doing all the research, and now you've got this problem because you're sitting at your desk, and you want to write a report. You want to write a scroll of all these stories, everything that's happened, but where the heck are you going to begin? Because there's just so much. How long is this report, this scroll, going to be? What are you going to leave in? Because flip, I can't leave that story about what Jesus did. I can't leave that out. Maybe I can leave this out, and you face the very problem that each one of the gospel writers faced. Because they want to end off, they want to make sure that they end off on a high, speaking about Jesus overcoming death. That they want to end off with in their gospels. But how do they start? Where do they start in the gospels? They look at the audience that they were writing to. So Matthew, for example, that acts a Jewish guy, and he's writing to, to a Jewish audience. He wants them to understand that Jesus wasn't just a prophet man. He wants them to get it, that Jesus is the Messiah. So he goes back all the way to the Old Testament. He starts off Matthew chapter 1, brings in the genealogy of Jesus. That's what Matthew does. It's like he, he ends up giving us the picture on the box of the puzzle. 
Some of you like building puzzles, eh, Jerry? 3,000 pieces plus my butt. And, and so the gospel writers, they don't just pour out the pieces on the table and say, well, put the pieces together. No, they give us a picture of Jesus. And then we put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Luke does the same thing. Right in the beginning of Luke chapter 1, open your Bible there, he gives us this picture of the puzzle. And it's found in verse 3. Let's read it together of chapter 1. Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, this is Luke speaking, I have been to the empty tomb. In other words, I've spoken to the witnesses. I've gone back. He says, I too decided, just like Matthew and the other guys, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. He's not just dumping the pieces of of the puzzle on the table. No, he wants to give us an orderly account. He wants to give us the picture on the box. He says, I'm giving this to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you, he has his purpose, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Luke says he's writing this book to give us the facts that he's so very carefully investigated, and then it's up to us. Then it's up to you, Adi. Then it's up to you, Tanya. Then we have to decide, are we going to take these facts and are we going to choose to believe in faith? What Luke is telling us here. Amen? And, and I can imagine Luke, he rocks up at the office of Theophilus. Maybe he has a cappuccino and, and, he, and he, he just slides the scroll across the table to Theophilus. And he says, this is what I'm giving you. These are the facts that I have carefully investigated. And he says, now I'm going to trust Theophilus that Jesus is going to help you to see and understand and believe the facts. And so that's what we have the choice to decide. Are we going to believe the facts or not? Are we going to choose to get stuck into God's Word or not? And I want to say if Sunday, fun day is the only day that you open your Bible because Daniel says I must open my Bible. I don't really feel like it. Then I tell you what, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we are going to be tossed around by the things around us that we hear and see the news, COVID this, COVID this, England this, Duke what, 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 we're going to be tossed around by all of those things, unless we choose to believe and get ourselves anchored in the Word of God. Just five, ten minutes a day, we're going to choose to open up God's Word. We've got the privilege to open up the gospel, friends, and allow God's gospel to mold us and shape us and lead us, and put the pieces of the puzzle that we find just sometimes don't make sense, to help God's Word in our relationships when we crash and we don't know why, when my marriage is on the rocks, when I've got victories in my life, how do I handle that and I don't become arrogant? We're going to allow the Word of God to mold us and shape us as we put the pieces together. Amen? Because that's what we're going to do when we go through Luke in the hall in the next couple of weeks. I don't know how long. We're going to trust that people's lives are going to be changed. Amen? So let's read our story today. Pick it up in verse 5. It says this. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of a ninja. It's the latest version there of that name there. His wife, Zechariah's wife, her name is Elizabeth. She was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But... They were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Herod, Zechariah, and Elizabeth, three main characters in our story today. Herod's important, Zechariah, obviously, and his wife, Elizabeth. Herod's a descendant of Esau. Now, if you know a bit of history about the Bible, we know God is the God of Abraham. God is the God of Isaac. You've heard that. God is the God of Jacob. Jacob, that oak, he's got a twin brother. His name's Esau. And the Bible says that from the very beginning when these guys came out of their mother's womb, there was conflict between the two of them. And if you take the bloodline of Jacob all the way back, you've got the Israelites right down to Jesus. Incredible, eh? You take the bloodline of Esau all the way down, it flows down to Herod. And so one theologian writes, he says, that the Edomites had a burning Hatred towards Israel. So if you take Esau's bloodline right down to Herod, you find this burning hatred towards Israel. And we can see that happening right in the beginning when King Herod, this oak, discovers that another king has been born. His name is Jesus. 
And so he gets a bit nervous, gets a bit insecure. He says to the wise men, show me where he is because I want to go and worship him. Rubbish. King Herod wants to kill Jesus. And then when he can't find baby Jesus, what does he do? He goes and kills every single boy under the age of two years old just to make sure that he kills the king. 14,000 innocent boys. Incredible, eh? And so what we're reading today has taken place under this very political, dark cloud atmosphere. Herod's this vindictive, wicked, paranoid king, very controlling. He's had his own wife murdered. He's had his kids murdered because he's so insecure about what they're doing around him. He's not quite sure what they're up to. That's the type of leader King Herod is. And the complete opposite side, you got Zechariah, normal guy. Pastor, complete opposite side of the scale. Simple man, hasn't got too much going for him. He comes from a town that actually doesn't even have a name. And we realize that because when Mary was pregnant, she went to go and visit Elizabeth, her cousin, Zachariah's wife. It says that at the time, Mary got ready, hurried on to a town where she entered Zachariah's home and she greeted Elizabeth, an unnamed town. The soakers growing up in the middle of nowhere. They live in this one horse town. The horses died. And so it's pretty accurate to assume that Zechariah doesn't even have his own church. Because in those days, if you wanted to have a synagogue, you needed at least 10 men to open up a synagogue. So he doesn't even have that going for him. In the middle of nowhere, and every few months, you know what Zechariah's got to do? He's got to go up to the temple and serve. So he leaves his one-horse town where the horses died, goes up to the temple and serves. And it's probably something like this. Well, the fancy flush loos need to be cleaned. Zachariah is in town. He can do it. You know those loos we hired last week on the land? They're a bit stinky. So Zachariah, my bud, you can do that. You can serve and get involved there for us. Or, or you know what? The floors of the, of the synagogue where the animals have been sacrificed, they're full of bloodstains. Zachariah, bud, can you do that? You're up. Clean the floors there for us, please. Or it's something like this. You know the sheep that we sacrificed? My goodness, the new sheep food from Pet Zone. It's done something to the sheep. Their poops are a bit stinky. Zachariah, my bud, can you clean that up for us, please? And so that's the life of this oak, Zachariah. He's got nothing going for him. And then we read about Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth. She's barren. Now that's a very big Massive deal in those times. Maybe you've been wondering what this big box is up on the stage here today. Can you read that, my bud? Can you, can you read what that says, but You got it there. So it says there. I'll tell you what it says. It says pregnancy tests. Zachariah's, Zachariah's wife. Month after month, she would take the test, Maybe. Now, I know they don't have pregnancy tests in those days. Okay, I get it. All right. But month after month, she would face the one stripe only on the pregnancy test. Yeah. Anybody pregnant here today? Don't be embarrassed, eh? Maybe. Anybody? There must be. Not you, eh, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Just, you're right there. Although, Elizabeth was also older. I don't know. And my mother's just moved to a new retirement village and all the boys are knocking on her door. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, check it out. Inviting her for lunch to the restaurant there. Yeah. Now, obviously, guys, those days they didn't have pregnancy tests. I get it. But for many, many, many years, Elizabeth, she would have come and she would have said, you know, Zachariah, just again this month I'm not pregnant. Just another one stripe. Just another one stripe. Month? After month, after month, year, after year, after year. And now, of course, they're in their twilight years, and everything that you see in the life of Elizabeth and Zechariah is just one stripe. Everywhere you look, his ministry, Zechariah's ministry, just one stripe. Their parenting, I mean, it's an obvious, just one stripe. Maybe they're looking after kids at times, but that's about the closest they get to parenting. Their marriage, their marriage would have creaked under the one strap. You know why? Because in those days, if you were barren and you couldn't have children, it was grounds for divorce. Yeah. 
They just seem to be stagnating. They, they, I think of, of their lives as Zechariah and Elizabeth, and, I, and I'm so challenged as I think about the other pastors in our city during lockdown, how they've just looked at their, their ministry and the church and think yeah, it's just one stripe, it's just a slog. And, and how many of those actually have bailed? And they said, you know what? It's just a one strap. It's never going to be a two strap. And, and they've quit. And they can't even face going back to church because all they think about is their one strap. Yeah? And when I read about Elizabeth and Zechariah, the crazy thing that, that I see is in verse 6 it says, Both Elizabeth and Zechariah were righteous in the Lord's eyes. They observed all the Lord's commands, they did everything that He asked them to do. They they observe these laws and decrees blamelessly, comma, but. I mean, they're doing everything right, but. They're childish. They're righteous, man. They're doing all the right things. And when temptation came my way, and you were given the opportunity to do that business deal, but you had to be involved in that bribery, you said, no, I'm not going to do that. I want my business to stand with integrity. But yet, just the one stripe. It's like, oh God, why? I'm doing everything right. I'm, being, I'm not being tempted to do that business deal, but still one stripe. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're a lady and that guy said, if you love me, you'll sleep with me. And you said, no. I want to live my life with integrity. I want to get married one day, having God's favor upon my life. But now you're growing up as a young woman and you may be in your 40s and you're thinking, it's a one strap, the chance of a two strap in my life, in my marriage. It's not going to happen. Eh? And in this situation, this is what Dr. Luke is actually talking about here, friends. He's starting his gospel like this. And you think, flip, man, what's Dr. Luke's point? So that's Zachariah's one strap laugh. Let's talk about Lizzie's one strap Life. It's even tougher. This one laugh, one strap strain. You see, she's the pastor's wife, and she's living with this stigma. You know what a stigma is? It's a mark, one strap mark of disgrace. She hasn't had a child, and if you add to that, she's a Jewish barren woman. That one strap means, according to custom, God has judged you. According to custom, if you aren't able to bear children, God's judgment is upon you. And so you come to church, and after the message, Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, says, can I pray for you? She's the pastor's wife. And you say, no, you can't pray for me. You've got God's judgment upon you. Well, I went to school with you, Elizabeth. You're a pastor's wife. You're all right. I'm not going to associate myself with you. you barren. God's judgment is upon you. You've done something wrong. Imagine how that feels. We prayed about God's judgment at the prayer meeting this morning. Can you imagine that? You know what the funny thing is? Where's Elizabeth? You know what Elizabeth's name means? Yeah, you are. You know what your name means, Elizabeth? It means the abundance of God. Now, now get that. I mean, her name means abundance of God. But yet, she's barren. And so we don't just have a random amount of pregnancy tests in the box here today. We've got a very specific amount of pregnancy tests in the box. Because every month, one of these would represent another month that Elizabeth would face. Another year that Elizabeth would face. One stripe only. Abundance of God? No. No humiliation, more shame, more disgrace, maybe next month, maybe maybe this time. Because God, I've repented of all my sin. I've made right with that person who lied about me and said such silly, ugly things. I've made right. Two-stripe life, God, I'm ready now. I've double-tithed, God. I've given you more than I should have this month. Give me a two-stripe, not just a one-stripe in my finances. Yeah, more than 400, one strap. More than 400, one strap only. 
More than 400 of these no's. More than 400 one stripes. God, where are you? I'm doing everything right. I'm obeying your laws and decrees and commands. God, where are you? More than 400. One stripe in the life of Elizabeth. 400 moments of rejection. 400 moments of shame. 400 times when Elizabeth, the one whose name means abundance of God, no, nah, it's one stop. Where are you, God? I've lived a righteous life. All I get, all I get is this one stop. I don't know about you reading this story today and, and seeing how Luke writes it, writes it, but if I was Theophilus, my goodness, man, I would have probably voice noted on my phone a message to Luke, and I would have said, but the stuff that you're writing about here, my brother, about this, this one stripe stuff, you got to burn the scroll, but because it's not going to fly in churches. You can't write about all this life and barrenness that Elizabeth's experiencing in the life of Zechariah. You can't. Rather just speak about the miracles and the half-lying stuff that Jesus did, how he fed the 5,000, how he healed that, that man when he was blind. Write about all the positive stuff. This stuff, but it's not going to fly in the churches in Benoni, but burn the stuff. But Luke is writing this stuff to Theophilus and to us today so that we have something to anchor ourselves to. Something that helps us put the pieces of the puzzle together as we go through life tomorrow. Luke is saying, yes, sometimes there is abundance of God. Sometimes there is the two strap in life. And we ask and we pray and we cry out and we say, God, my kids, my teenage son, please. And there's breakthrough. And God does something incredible in your kids' lives. They start making good decisions. And then we're worrying about our marriage because, man, I feel so disconnected from my wife emotionally. My wife is here, don't worry. We are still married. She's just had kids. But I'm saying you, you pray and you commit your, your marriage to the Lord and then breakthrough comes and you're starting to connect emotionally going, thank you, Jesus. And my finance, God, you know what's happening in my bank accounts and God provides miraculously. Thank you, two stripes. Yes, sometimes, yes, the abundance of God does come. Sometimes. But what do we have? All the time. What do you and I have the privilege of experiencing all the time? God's presence. God's love. God's mercy. God's forgiveness all the time. And so Luke is saying, yes, there's this tension where we've got this one stripe and then it becomes two stripes, life. Yes, this tension that God never resolves. There's the abundance of God sometimes. But what you and I can anchor ourselves into is the picture of Jesus, the presence of God all the time. What's your one stripe today? Every one of us has got a one stripe. Even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, even if there are no grapes on the vine, even if the harvest fails and fields produce no food, even if the sheep pens are empty and the stalls don't have cattle, yet I will praise the Lord my God. Yet I will raise a hallelujah. Sometimes, sometimes He provides in abundance. Sometimes we have that two stripe, but all the time He provides His presence. All the time, all the time, ma'am, He holds you. All the time, He wipes those tears. Our God, our living God is the only God who keeps your tears and keeps them in a jar. That's what the Bible tells us. Why? Because He knows and because He's with you as you go through life and as you try and put the pieces of the puzzle together. But you know, when you have to live like Zechariah and Elizabeth, man, that's where the rubber hits the tar. That's when it's really tough, eh? Let's see this morning how Zechariah stayed on course. He doesn't get divorced, although he could have legally, he had grounds to get divorced. He, he doesn't get bitter or cynical. He, he doesn't leave the ministry. 
He doesn't hustle on the side and think, you know what, that chick, mm, if I can get somebody else pregnant, then I can carry on the family bloodline. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He remains steadfast. This is where the rubber hits the top. He remains steadfast in prayer. He anchors himself in God who holds him secure. And he's still found praying, still for breakthrough. When all hope is lost, he still turns to God in heaven day after day after day. Look at verse 8. Have a look there. Read it with me. It's just another day for Zechariah. Just another one-stripe day in the life of Zechariah. He's serving God in the temple. Eyes are closed. He's praying to God. Another ordinary one-stripe day. And then in a moment, boom, everything changes. Verse 11, he opens his eyes and an angel of the Lord is standing right next to him. And when Zechariah sees him, he's startled, gripped with fear. The angel said to him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Yeah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. You know what John means? Gracious gift. Amazing, eh? Gracious gift. Angel says to him, a gracious gift will come to you from that dry womb. I want to say to you today, I don't know. I don't know what your barrenness is. But God's gracious gift will come to you. How? Through his word. A gracious gift might be to stripe abundance of God. It might be. But it might just be the presence of God where He holds you secure and where He keeps your tears in that jaw. I don't know what you are so desperately wanting to see breakthrough in your life. I, I, I don't know what that barrenness is in your life, that one stop. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your relationship. Maybe it's your boss that you think, oh, he's never going to change. It's just the way he treats people. Maybe it's that. Maybe your work environment, yes. Maybe your finances. Maybe your future. Maybe your future. And you know what? Maybe you heard this week there was a glimpse of two stripe happening. It's on the horizon. You've got the job. Or you've been accepted into that. Or, and, and then suddenly it's just been taken away. And it's just back. One stripe. I want to say gracious gift came from that dry womb. What Luke says to Theophilus and what Luke says to us today, he says, I want to show you something. I want to show you Jesus in the story. That's what he's saying to us. Look at your story, sir. Just go back today, man. Reflect on your story and see Jesus in your story. Trust him because he's the one that brings gracious gifts from dry womb, might not be what you think, but it's what God knows. Bring your one stripe. Bring it. Bring that one stripe to Jesus today. Saying, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. I'm going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. Our king is alive. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we close our eyes? Can we close our eyes? Let's just pause here at this moment. And I'll ask you again, what's your one strap? What is your one strap? What's your one strap? We all have a one strap. Ah, I've been praying this whole week. Lord, how are we going to land today? What do you want to do today, God? And then a man comes to me before the service. He says, I have a, such a sense that people need to respond today. What's your one strap? I, I, I want to be bold today. I want to ask Elizabeth, will you come and stand here? This is a lady in our church, three, four generations. Jerry, Jerry, come and stand here, but I didn't know I was going to do this. 
This is a lady in our church whose son passed away a few weeks ago. I can't think of anything more difficult than, than losing a, a, a son and losing a brother. You know, it's not supposed to be like that. And I was thinking so much of you this week, Elizabeth. One stripe, but yet your name means abundance of God. I think if there's someone that I can use this message to honor this morning, it would be you, Elizabeth. The abundance of God, but yet, but yet, I've lost my son. And so I want to ask, I want to thank you for being up here, but I want to ask, will you take this one stripe? Will you hold it? Because maybe somebody else will come up with you as you stand here with your one strap of sadness. And as you give your one strap of sadness to God, your one strap, take this home. Keep lifting it up and saying, God, this is my one strap. I'm giving it to you. Maybe today you want to come and you want to take one of these pregnancy tests. If you want to. Put it up somewhere or in the cupboard or somewhere so that no one asks you any questions. Okay, you get that right. But you bring a one strap. You, you, you take this pregnancy test home. Oh, Daryl, you wasted God's money. Maybe this message changes your life. Maybe you look at the pregnancy test in your cupboard or in the safe or in your drawer tomorrow, next week, next month. You say, my one strap, my one strap. And the rest of these we're going to donate to a a pregnancy crisis clinic, so don't worry, okay? But you you take it home, Elizabeth. And I pray today, maybe you come and stand with Elizabeth. You grab one. I'm going to grab one because I've got a one strap in my life. And we just sing a song, raising a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. We stand here. That's you. Please stay here. You're okay. So this is Jerry. He loves puzzles. And Jerry, my mate, as you carry on asking God to put the pieces of the puzzle together in your life, take this one strap, put, yes, take this one strap, put it somewhere where no one sees it, but God knows. Take, take this one strap and say, God, my future is my kids grow old and leave the home. And let's, let's, let's trust God.